Hello everyone to the second in our series of seven thought-provoking target antibiotic webinars. I'm Professor Clearner Head of McNulty, Head of Public Health England's Primary Care Unit and PHE Lead for the Target Antibiotics Project. Here with me today are Professor Michael Moore, who has more than 25 years experience in general practice and much experience in infection-related research. And also we have Dr Stephen Granier, who's a practicing GP in Bristol and also the RCGP Target Antibiotics Clinical Lead. So, last week we discussed the great benefits of exploring your antibiotic prescribing. Today, we're going to discuss respiratory tract infections and Michael will present data on how your antibiotic use can influence antibiotic resistance, how using a clinical score in acute sore throat can help optimise your prescribing. So, we'll now watch Michael's presentation. So while you're watching the video, think about the questions you would like to put to us in the live Q&A afterwards. You can do this by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel during or after the video. So let's sit back and enjoy. Hello, yes, my name is Michael Moore. I'm a GP by background and I've been involved in clinical research for the past 20 years or so. And I'm going to share with you some of the findings from that research and how they relate to GP antibiotic prescribing with a focus on respiratory tract infection and uh, in particular on management of acute sore throat. So this is a summary of what I'm going to be running through today. I'm going to just touch on antibiotic resistance. I'm going to then be talking to you about why GP prescribing matters. Then just thinking about respiratory tract infections and why we might be prescribing for them. Then I'm going to focus down at the end on acute sore throat management. And then finally um, with an action summary. So the antibiotic resistance crisis. This has been headline news uh, over the past four or five years and I'm sure that this won't have passed you all by. Um, the uh, papers are reporting that resistance could uh, bring an end to the antibiotic era and that uh, people have suggested the world is entering an antibiotic crisis which will for instance make routine operations uh, highly dangerous and lead to minor infections becoming potentially fatal. The WHO have reported several times. This report uh, showed that antibiotic resistance is a worldwide problem, all regions of the world having high levels of antibiotic resistance. Um, the, the WHO showed the burden of antibiotic resistance um, and summarised it in some areas. Of course, there isn't uh, data for all areas of the world, but already there is significant burden of resistance. And uh, the, the series of O'Neill reports have highlighted antibiotic resistance and the uh, estimate is that by 2050 that deaths from antibiotic resistance will be approximately equivalent to deaths from cancer. So why does GP antibiotic prescribing matter? Uh, if we think about what's happening now, uh, we on average prescribe for more than half of people seeing us with acute respiratory infection. You can see cough and bronchitis around half, 60% of people presenting with sore throat and around 60% with otitis media. And GPs account for around 80% of all the antibiotics prescribed for humans in the UK. So it is a problem for, for, for primary care to think about. Uh, if we think about resistance in primary care, we're not particularly aware of it at the moment. Obviously, you'll get reports back periodically where there are resistant, resistant organisms, but resistance levels are generally increasing. Uh, this is a meta-analysis where, which has looked at individual level resistance following antibiotic treatment, and individuals have at least a doubling of the risk of carrying a resistant bug two months after an antibiotic course and that persists for around about 12 months. So at an individual level, people who have antibiotics are going to be more likely to be carrying resistant organisms. Finally, if we just think about prescribing and consultation rate, is there a link between those two? Uh, there's a tenfold variation in the consultation rate 
for respiratory tract infection between practices and a big variation in the proportion of those who will receive an antibiotic prescription. Uh, if you look carefully at this, you'll see that uh, high prescribing practices are the ones with uh, high consultation rates, and practices which reduce their, consulta their prescribing rates experience a reduction in consultation rates following this. So it looks as if what we do in our surgeries is influencing the people who come and see us in the future, and that by changing our behaviour it may well change consultation patterns in the future. So just before I move on, just to summarise where we've got to, antibiotic resistance is important, GP prescribing is an important part of that, uh, GPs currently prescribe more than most of the time when people consult with a respiratory infection and higher prescribing is both linked to resistance and higher consultation rates in the future. So bearing all that in mind, why are we prescribing so much for respiratory infections? And they, the, there are several drivers of that. Maybe we're thinking that we'll provide good relief of symptoms with a prescription. Maybe it's worry about complications or more serious illness. And maybe it's a response to patient pressure or a combination of those things. So I'm going to deal with each of those in turn. Firstly, thinking about relief of symptoms. And this is data lifted from the, the NICE guidelines on re treatment of respiratory tract infection. And uh, the circle there is around the expected average benefit for a course of antibiotics in each of those illnesses. So you can see the best you can hope for is a day's reduction in symptom duration between 12 and 24 hours for all of those conditions, so titus media, sore throat, sinusitis, and bronchitis. So not much uh, evidence of substantial relief from symptoms then with antibiotics. What about complications? Uh, this is uh, uh, data which has been published earlier this year uh, from routine data comparing uh, high prescribing and low prescribing practices and looking for an association between prescribing rates at practice level and complication rates uh, from uh, infection. And there was no, a, no association between the risk of mastoiditis, empyema, meningitis, or intracranial abscess and prescribing rates. There was an association, though, between prescribing rates and the risk of pneumonia and peritonsillar abscess. So we went on to try and put numbers on that. And so if a, a, a practice of 7,000 reduced its prescribing of antibiotics by about 10%, then they might see one additional case of pneumonia in a year and one additional peritonsillar abscess every 10 years. So although there is an association between antibiotic prescribing, uh, the magnitude of that effect is small. Um, Peterson looked at this some years ago at an individual patient level and estimated that to prevent a complication, you needed to treat around 4,000 people. Uh, complications, follow, uh, pneumonia following res lower respiratory tract infection was more common though. Uh, with a number needed to treat of only 39 in the over 65 year old group uh, with a, a number needed to treat of around 100 in the under 65s. And this is reflected in the NICE uh, guidance where there's a, a, a rule for treating people with lower respiratory tract infection with some risk factors. Finally, just to look at patient demand, uh, this was uh, looked at some years ago, and it, by and large, GPs overestimate patient demand. It can be a significant problem, uh, and you know, 30 to 40 percent of people do come with the intention of getting a prescription for antibiotics. But people also want information about how to relieve their symptoms, what the diagnosis is, uh, what the natural history is likely to be, and reassurance about what the future holds for them. So the, you do need to address the demand and you need to think about what else patients might want to hear. So now I'm going to move on to antibiotics and acute sore throat. So the focus on specifically on the research relating to this and then to think about how best to manage acute sore throat, what the best evidence is now. So again, we're going to think about symptom benefit, avoiding complications, patient demand, and then targeting those at high risk. So if we look at that nice guideline chart again, but focusing on sore throat, you can see that on average people wait around three days before they see the doctor. 
they have symptoms for five to seven days after they've seen the doctor, so we'll have symptoms for seven to ten days. And you might expect a 12 to 24 hour reduction in symptoms giving an antibiotic prescription. This is uh, data from a randomised controlled trial of people with acute sore throat and uh, the three groups represented on this graph are uh, people randomised to immediate antibiotics, delayed antibiotics or no antibiotics and this shows the proportion recovered over time and it's really difficult to tell the difference between those three lines so any of those strategies uh, result in similar patient outcomes. Thinking about complications, we've, uh, we've collected some uh, observational data to inform the risk of complications. If you look at trial data, although it's very helpful looking at uh, outcomes in terms of symptoms, there aren't enough people in trials to determine whether antibiotic strategies influence complication rates. So we collected information on nearly 14,000 adults presenting with an acute sore throat. And a relatively small number of them went on to develop complications, just over 1%. And around about 3 in 1,000 ended up with a, a quinsy following that presentation. We looked at predictors of adverse outcome and we did find two predictors of adverse outcome, severe ear pain and severe tonsillar inflammation. But the odds ratios of those at just over 2 weren't that helpful in clinical practice when complications are so rare. So just as a rule of thumb to kind of think about what happens after a sore throat consultation, around 1 in 10 people will reconsult. Uh, around 1 in 100 will have a suppurative complication of some kind, and 1 in 1,000 a significant complication. And it's hard to determine in advance who's going to go on and get one of those more significant complications. We also used that same data set to look at the outcome according to antibiotic strategy and that was immediate antibiotics, a delayed or just in case prescription or no antibiotic prescription. And we, we showed that antibiotics uh, were associated with a reduction in suppurative complications around about one third. But interestingly delayed antibiotics appeared to have the same or similar effect. So currently, what, uh, what do the NICE guidance say? They, su they suggest we use a scoring sim uh, system called uh, Centaur. And uh, they, they recommend that if you have a score of three or more, uh, and the score consists of pus on the tonsils, a history of fever, presence of tender lymph nodes, and the absence of cough, they say if you have a score of three or more, then you can consider an antibiotic. Otherwise, use no antibiotic or a delayed antibiotic strategy. So the NICE guidance is suggesting some targeting to those at high risk. Is there anything that we can add to that? Uh, can we improve on the Centaur score? Uh, or, and what's the role of rapid near patient testing? So we've, uh, we've looked at both these things. Firstly, thinking about can the Centaur score be improved, it was developed in uh, an emergency department setting and it was used to predict the presence of group A streptococci. And it's not that selective. Um, and just to show you, uh, just to think about whether other streptococci might be important, we looked at the presence of various uh, streptococci in the throat and this is a graph showing the association of a positive swab with symptoms. And you can see that group A is important, but group C and G uh, is also associated with symptoms. And C and G is present in around 20% of, of swabs from people presenting with sore throats. So if you use a score which is focused on predicting group A strep, you're going to miss the C and Gs. So we went on to, uh, in a cohort study, develop um, predictors of A, C and G and we came up with the acronym fever pain and the, the score consists of fever in the last 24 hours, a, hist a pus on the tonsils, attending rapidly, that means early in the onset of the illness, the presence of severely inflamed tonsils and the absence of cough. So sharing some features with the Centaur score. Just to give you an idea of how this new score performs compared to the, compared to the Centaur, this is the Centaur score 
uh, in, the po in a population of presenting, uh, people presenting with acute sore throat. And you can see there uh, that those present with a score of 0 or 1, they have low levels of strep in the throat and that uh, represents around about 25% of the population. You can see scores of 3 or 4, those which are targeted by the NICE guidance with levels of around 50% of streptococci and that's around about 40% uh, of the population. So quite a high level of the population with that high score. If you compare that to fever pain, you've got uh, at the left-hand side there the Norton 1 score, similarly low levels of streptococci, but uh, a larger proportion, around 40% of people with that low score, and then a smaller number with a high score, uh, only 17% with a score of 4 or more. So it looks as if uh, the fever pain score might be a, a slightly more efficient, if you like, at identifying people with a low risk of carrying streptococci in the throat. We went on to test that in a clinical trial and uh, we showed that the use of the fever pain score re did uh, reduce antibiotic prescribing and improved symptom control. And the control group in this trial was delayed prescribing. So what previously would have been regarded as maybe the gold standard was a delayed prescription. Then using the targeted score improved symptom control and uh, further reduced antibiotic uptake. We also in that trial looked at uh, near patient testing and just to show you the results here so there's the fever pain score in the middle compared to the control showing a reduction in the severity of sore throat, uh, a reduction in the duration and a reduction in the antibiotic use. Uh, it, it was, it, uh, the addition of the near patient uh, test for uh, streptococci didn't add any value over use of the score alone. So in conclusion then, targeting antibiotics using a clinical score does improve symptoms and reduce antibiotic use for sore throat, but uh, near patient tests used according to the clinical score had similar benefits but no clear advantage. So to summarise, in acute sore throat, outcomes are similar using immediate versus delayed prescribing. Short-term reconsultation is higher with a no prescribing strategy and immediate prescribing encourages a belief in antibiotics and future reconsultation. Complications of acute sore, throat are, are acute sore throat are rare and they're hard to predict, but delayed antibiotics are probably as effective as immediate antibiotics to prevent complications. Remember that A, C and G are all important and C and G uh, constitute around 20% of the people, the population attending with acute sore throat. Fever pain was designed to predict the presence of AC and G, and if you use fever pain rather than Centaur, then that does result in better symptom control and lower antibiotic use than a delayed prescription. So what's the optimal strategy now? We think it's a targeted prescription using a clinical score, a default position of a delayed prescribing strat strategy. You can use the score to identify those with more severe symptoms who might need an immediate prescription and then those with intermediate scores then still use a delayed prescribing strategy. So fever pain is hard to remember but you don't have to remember it because it's available on a website. The link is here. If you click on that it'll take you to a scoring tool and then you can cut and paste the results from that into your clinical notes. It also recommends a treatment strategy based on the score. So you don't need to remember what the components are nor how to score it, Just you just need to remember how to find that website and you can drag that onto your desktop. So what's, what should you do now? Think about sore throat prescribing in your practice. Maybe do an audit of prescribing and come back as a group and discuss that because you want to be all following a similar prescribing pattern. Is the default position in your practice a delayed prescription or no prescription? And if not, why not? Challenge that using the evidence which I presented to you today. Talk about fever pain. Put the link to that on everyone's desktop and then repeat the audit next year. What's in it for me, or what's in it for you? Well, firstly, you'll feel good about your prescribing in your practice. You'll reduce your 
uh, antibiotic prescribing, which will reduce the selection pressure on the bacteria. And potentially reducing prescribing in your practice will have a knock-on effect in terms of workload because we think that reduced prescribing is followed by reduced consultation rate. So feel good and work a bit less hard. And that's it. Welcome back. I trust you found that video interesting. Now's your chance to quiz Michael Moore and Steve Grenier on any issues. If you want to see us in glorious Technicolor, you'll need to press the little um, arrow in the bottom right hand side of your screen. So um, I've got a question first to start us off, um, Steve. So um, what's your experience of using fever pain in your own practice? So Cleona, we have been using Centaur Score for a number of years and about six months ago we changed over to using fever pain. And I have spent some time asking my colleagues about how they found it. And we all much prefer using fever pain to, to using Centaur. I think anecdotally our experience is, and, and that is backs up the evidence, uh, that, um, was backed up by the evidence, is that we would re have reduced our antibiotic prescribing, certainly reduced immediate antibiotic prescribing, uh, and we are probably prescribing more deferred anti or delayed antibiotics. Um, one of the things that I like about, especially the online tool, the um, if, if you put in a fever pain into a Google search engine, it will bring up the, the tool that's been shown on the video. Uh, it also has a symptom severity score, and that's been really useful as well to talk to patients about their symptoms and, and to consider whether antibiotics on this occasion is the right thing to do, especially for those patients who've always expected antibiotics in the past. Okay, well that actually brings me on to another interesting question um, from Abby, um, Michael. You said that in, in your um, presentation that the fever pain score also resulted in improved symptom control. How did you do this? Well, in the, uh, the trial, we provided the patients who took part in the trial with a diary, which they filled in for the duration of their illness. And we were able to analyze the diary scores afterwards, and we particularly concentrate on the duration of moderately bad symptoms. And the idea of that is that well, when your symptoms are slight or mild, that probably you can get back to work and they're not bothering you very much. But moderately bad symptoms might keep you off work and they would interfere with your life. So you, when you talk to patients, it's useful to think about well, how long will the moderately bad symptoms last for. And the, in, the, in that trial, the delayed prescription group, the median duration was five days. And when we looked at the uh, fever pain group, the median duration was four days, so a, a roughly a day less of moderately bad symptoms, and that was statistically significant. There was some reduction in the, uh, the group which was allocated to the use of the, uh, the near patient test, but that didn't reach statistical significance. So it certainly looks as if using the fever pain score uh, has the potential anyway to reduce the symptom burden for your patients. So what do you think can you hypothesise why this might be? Yes, it's difficult to know why that might be. Uh, obviously, we think that using the score perhaps is better at targeting the antibiotics so that for, to the small number of people who really need them, so the people with a high score, the kind of 17% or so of the population, where you will probably recommend either a shorter delay or uh, an immediate prescription. And then obviously there's a group of people who probably were never going to get any, any benefit. So, but we don't know exactly why that happens, but it certainly seems to be the case. So this brings me on to a question from um, one of the participants. And do please um, um, add some more questions. So a GP is asked, should we use fever, fever pain as a tool to reassure patients? Well, I think it is quite useful if you go to the online uh, system and you can share that with the patient. You can work through those little radio buttons and get people to help you uh, assess their sore throat. And then uh, when you click on the score summary, it, uh, it tells you roughly the, the risk of carrying or having a streptococcus in your throat. So you can then, if people end up with a low score, say, well, there's probably around about a 10% chance of you having streptococcus in your throat, which is about the same as if we went out and got 100 throat swabs from members of the public, there'd be around about 10% of them would be carrying streptococcus. So we're, you're roughly at the rate of background carriage. So I think it is useful, you can say to people, well, you're in this low risk group, you're unlikely to have streptococcus. That means you're most likely to have a virus. Antibiotics will have 
almost no impact on your symptoms uh, apart, and so that probably you're more likely to get side effects from the antibiotics than benefit from them. So that's serious um, reassurance I would think. Yeah. So Steve, um, how do you use the fever pain score with a delayed backup prescription combining those two things together? So firstly, using a fever pain tool, uh, and there, there are different ways of, of using it in practice. I, I tend to go onto the, the website and, and use it there. Um, it is also, you, you can, it's in the Public Health England's guidelines um, on, on acute sore throat treatment. So you can find fever pain there if you, if you don't know where else to look for it. And uh, that's on the Target Antibiotic That's on the Target right? Antibiotic website. And <laughs> A number of uh, practices have actually incorporated into their clinical systems, and it is possible to do that. Um, so, so using the tool, um, you end up with a score of of naught to one, which suggests that uh, it's low risk of, of of streptococcal infection, and uh, a no antibiotic strategy is is chosen there. A score of two to three um, is is. Uh, sort of intermediate probability and in those patients we then use a delayed or deferred, a three day delayed or deferred antibiotic prescription um, and for those with four or more you can give antibiotics immediately. Uh, but again the symptom severity will also allow you to, to, to discuss with some patients whether to defer antibiotics even in those with a slightly higher score. Okay, so actually that brings us on to a few questions. One, um, there's one comment from Joanne who actually says in Wakefield, if there's any other GPs out there, we promote fever pain score tool as a template on the GP clinical systems. And there's another one um, from Robin who's saying, are there protocols that can be imported into the clinical systems from, um, from such a system one or EMIS web? Do so you know we, about so, that? So there are protocols that can allow you to incorporate this into your system. Um, at the moment, uh, so a number of practices are doing this. It seems, for, certainly for EMIS practices, you have to contact your system supplier to, to get the instructions as to how to do that. We are going to try and put some information on the website uh, about how to do that. Uh, otherwise, if you email the, the, the link on the website, if you, have, if you are, are unable to do it with your, your system supplier, then we will try and send back specific instructions on how to do that. Okay. Um, so now Sarah's asked um, this question. What, uh, my practice has a policy of not using um, delayed backup prescribing. So how would we use the fever pain score then? Do you want to answer that? Yeah, yes. Michael, yeah. Yes, the, uh, certainly not everyone likes the delayed or just in case prescribing. And I have to say we're moving away from using a delayed, calling it delayed, because that's delayed from the doctor's point of view. And the patients might say, what do you mean delayed? Why do I have to delay? So now we tend to talk about just in case prescribing or an emergency prescription saying that you don't need a prescription now, but just in case you need one in the future, then you can be in charge of it. Some practices still don't like that, saying, well, it's mixed messages. If I decide somebody doesn't need a prescription, why should I be issuing one? So if you're one of those practices, uh, then obviously you'll have another way of dealing with this. And that might be, for instance, to say, well, you're in this intermediate risk group. I still don't think an antibiotic ne is necessary. But if you're getting worse in a few days' time, if your fever's going up, you're getting pain, whatever, that you can phone the practice and speak to me or call the duty doctor, whatever the system is in your practice. So it is possible to use the fever pain score without using the delayed element if that's something which doesn't sit comfortably with your practice. So here's a good question from Alistair. Um, how long should we be delaying? How long do we delay the backup prescription for? How long do we get them to come? Yes. How well, many days? I mean, what, what's the... I think what that, do we uh, do and what did you do in the trials and what are you suggesting that GPs do? I think you have to take into account the natural history of the illness and so uh, with acute sore throat people usually wait two or three days before they see you and the illness is going to last between eight and ten days. So it depends on how acutely people are coming, how long you're expecting them to be before they start to get better. So I tend to tailor it a little bit and we'll be using a three or five day delay with acute sore throat. But if I see someone with an, a lower respiratory tract infection, uh, where the natural history is much longer than that, so that people wait probably about eight days before they see you and they're going to be ill for 10 or 12 days afterwards, a three week illness in total, then if you say wait three days, they'll clearly still have a cough. 
So I, in fact, I tend to say, wait a little bit longer than that, and I'm not expecting your cough to be better by then, uh, but it should be starting to improve, and watch out for you know, your cough deteriorating, becoming short of breath, getting chest pain, developing high fever. So giving that very clear safety net advice and very specific guidance about how long I'm expecting the illness to last for and what to watch out for uh, so that people are quite clear about when they should and shouldn't be using the antibiotics. Okay, so here's a question from um, John. Currently, you say um, in your figures that 60% of patients with acute sore throat are prescribed antibiotics, and we can reduce this. What rate should we be aiming at? Do you know anything, um, what so do that, you think? That's a very hot topic at the moment. What's a safe lower limit for prescribing? Um, the, that's a, a topic which is being discussed at a, na a national level on the advisory board to the government about you know what should we be aiming for. If you look at that European data, then the UK is prescribing around twice as much antibiotics, twice as many antibiotic courses per head of population as they do in Sweden and um, in the Netherlands, for instance. And you're not looking at high rates of complications in those countries. They're not places you'd be fearful of going because you, you worry you might get a, a septic complication. So I think we could quite happily halve the number of antibiotics that we're currently using and still be prescribing safely. Um, the European, there's a European group who've looked at this specifically, and they've recommended uh, that around that the target should be around 20%. Of, uh, of sore throats ending up with, a, with a, a prescription. And if you look at the fever pain score, you'll see that the, in an average population, then uh, people with a high score, that accounts for about 17%. So actually, if you use fever pain, you'll probably be prescribing for an immediate antibiotic for less than 20% of your population, and then a delayed prescription for that intermediate group. So you'd probably end up in that ballpark figure 20, 25% of the time there'll be a prescription. Okay, so Steve, um, I don't know whether you use triaging in your practice or whether you have nurse prescribers, but this um, Susie wants to ask, um, do you have to see the patient to do the score? And could we, could we use this for telephone? consultation and triaging so mm. that we could reduce face-to-face -face consultation. So maybe you will have a <laughs> yes. bit of a discussion here, well, see what you uh, think, because uh, um, yeah, with, with I'm not sure whether you can see pass um, down no, the telephone. No. Well, I suppose you could, but someone could send a photograph in, I, I guess it's possible. I mean, people do that more and more. Essentially, this is a, a score that's based on you examining the patient, looking at their throat. Um, so, so generally speaking, it would be someone that we would see. I mean, if you're considering prescribing, then ideally you should you should see the patient and make that decision. Um, but, but I guess it, it, you know, it, it, I, I don't know how well you can actually see. I suppose a very carefully taken photograph. Maybe you can make a, a judgment about that. But by the time but you see the photograph, <laughs> you would get the patient in and look at their throat. It would yeah. probably be easier to do that. You yeah. can certainly get. Some what do you think, Mike? Yeah, you can get some elements of this on the phone, and if you're aware of the of the components of the score, then of course, if somebody has, uh, you know, they've got a cough and a cold with it. Yes. Um, uh, they haven't got a history of fever, you can already start to think, well, they're at lower risk. So uh, I obviously do telephone triage as part of my day job, and sometimes I will talk about this with the patients and talk about the, you know, the fact that most of the time people get better on their own, that we're expecting their illness to last eight to ten days, that antibiotics at best are going to give them 12 to 24 hours reduction in their symptoms and a risk of, of, of problems. If people are still at that point, either they're telling me they're very sick, then, then you should be seeing them. Uh, but very often people will say, well, actually, that's very interesting. I don't think I want to bother to come in for an assessment. I'm very happy to wait and see and get back in touch if my symptoms are not you know, following the course that you describe. So I think that you can, uh, on the phone, you can negotiate on the phone using some of the elements of the score, but clearly you can't complete the score in its entirety on the phone because it does involve, as you say, uh, a clinical examination. So the sicker patients, people who you're thinking about prescribing, then come in, do a face-to-face -face assessment. Uh, the people who, where you get the impression that they're probably at the milder end of the spectrum, then maybe negotiate about the natural history and the fact that they're unlikely to end up with a, with a, a prescription following a consultation. 
Um, so, um, Steve, somebody's asking about read coding. Do you read code your fever pain, or do you read code the components of it? I, I, at the moment on Emus, I don't know if we can read code it. So we um, we enter we enter it uh, as a as a um, so the individual components, and then I do free text fever pain so that we can go back and audit that. Um, if we're wanting to audit all our patients with tonsillitis or a sore throat code. Uh, but ideally, uh, if the score is incorporated into the clinical system, then that would be able to be recoded. Okay. Um, so here's a little bit of a discussion point. Um, so Diane has asked, um, why should we be decreasing our use of penicillin for acute sore throat when there is no evidence that it is actually increasing resistance? in streptococci. That's Michael's. Yeah. That's definitely mm. Michael's yeah, baby, Michael's, is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think, I think um, that you have to think about the kind of wider picture that more use of antibiotics in the community is associated with higher resistance rates, not necessarily in streptococci, but perhaps in pneumococci and other organisms. That when you expose people to penicillin, they may not get uh, resistance in the streptococcus, but they may develop resistance in other bugs in their gut. Uh, the resist resistance is often carried on plasmids, uh, which are transmissible between organisms. So uh, you generate kind of resistance, kind of uh, bugs, plasmids. You're you're encouraging selection of those. So I think in general terms, it's better that we reduce the selection pressure in the environment by reducing antibiotic use. Okay, and, and a further point I could make is that when you've got penicillin allergic patients, you're using a macrolide, so clarithromycin, so that encourages resistance, and clarithromycin resistance across Europe is now increasing a lot, and so we want to um, reduce, especially in those penicillin allergic patients, the, mm. the macrolides, and azithromycin specifically is a major problem it's got a very long half-life and resistance with that is greater than with the other macrolides. So um, we do need to be careful about that. So, um, oh, I've, so there's a question here from Moira, I think that is. Um, does um, delayed prescribing or a fever pain not increase reconsultation rates compared to um, no prescribing? Well, there's pretty clear evidence that delayed prescribing reduces reconsultation rates. So that's been shown uh, really fairly consistently that that's the case. In the trials, uh, you can measure people's intention to reconsult. So the original sore throat trial from the mid-90s, uh, the intention to reconsult was reduced in the, uh, in the delayed prescribing group. Uh, when we went on to follow up that group, uh, then the actual reconsultation rates were lower. Uh, the big observational study we did with 14,000 patients, reconsultation rates were lower with delayed prescribing. We've shown a similar effect uh, in, a, in another even bigger cohort of just under 30,000 patients with lower respiratory tract infection. So I think that it's pretty clear that uh, delayed prescribing seems to be a positive thing in terms of reducing uh, reconsultation. I don't think we know very clearly from the use of fever pain because you need quite big studies and follow-up in order to know what impact that would have. There would be no reason in my mind to think that using that score would uh, increase reconsultation, but I don't have any firm evidence But the to rapid antigen that. detection test, um, patients are more likely to want to come back, aren't they? Well, certainly anecdotally people talk about that. Uh, the other test which is quite commonly used in lower respiratory tract infection is the CRP test. And I know the Scandinavians who, uh, it's really very widely used in Scandinavia, and they say that they now get people coming back to see them who say, well, I didn't think I needed an antibiotic, but I wanted to have the test. So there is a worry that if you do something um, a little bit more invasive, which involves a test that you might encourage people, you might medicalise the illness, but I don't think we've got clear evidence that that is the case at the moment. So um, there's a question here from Susan about um, actually scoring your, you know, your fever pain. So we've got severely inflamed tonsils. So how do you define how inflamed and is it how sore it is? What, how yeah. do you assess that? Maybe we could give, mm. you know, is there, are there any anecdotes or, you know, yes. assessments? <laughs> when you did the study, did you have specific instructions about no. how you... No. no, we didn't do. I mean, we essentially presented people with a, a scale 
uh, on which they placed the patient and there was no prior training so it was really I guess if you're using experienced GPs they all have seen lots of people without inflamed tonsils and pe people with really inflamed tonsils and uh, and it's where they put them on that point. So you had a scale none Yes. mild, moderate, severe. That's the kind of thing, exactly yeah, right. Yes, so it was people yes. who had really severe. So yes, and the patients what, what, the, what yeah. characterises somebody with severe inflamed tonsils? So I mean, I think, when you look yeah. in, what does it look mm. like? I think that's one of the worries about using this particular score is that there is a judgment involved mm. there. And when you use the, uh, the online tool, then you've, got, you've still got that range there, which uh, it's slightly less obvious to the user exactly what the cut point is. So I'm hoping mm. a greater degree of kind of honesty you're not trying to manipulate the score by saying oh yes it's severe because you fancy prescribing penicillin mm. but it, it, there isn't any firm definition I don't know whether you, in your clinical practice. I don't practice have a firm definition but I, I've got a good idea if I look if I see a severely severely inflamed tonsil you know it's going to be there's going to be swelling uh, usually the tissue looks a little bit edematous it's deep deeply red inflamed um, so so I think you, 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 know, you are getting a clinical impression from, from maybe just enlarged tonsils or enlarged tonsils with a little bit of pus streak on them. So, um. Okay, there's lots of questions coming in about delayed prescribing. And just to say that a webinar four, we're going to be talking about delayed and backup mm. prescribing mm. in all the different types of respiratory tract infections and mention UTI as well. So um, we're not going to have any more questions around that today. Um, here's an interesting one because I think we were discussing complications earlier on. So how much should a patient's previous experience with either response to antibiotics or complications influence our decision to prescribe again for the same patient? Mm -hmm. I think you had a bit of a story yeah, to well tell, Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting one. I mean, one of the questions that I wanted to ask Michael was, you know, what do I say to my patient who comes to me and says, you know, I saw you a few weeks ago, I had really sore throat, you didn't prescribe antibiotics and I've ended up in hospital for two days with, uh, with a Quincy. Um, and, uh, and I think that, you, you know, that, that is a, a bit of a challenge. Um, uh, do, do you have any thoughts on that, Michael? Yes, well, I think uh, we know that it's difficult to predict who's going to get a septic complication. We looked in that cohort of 14,000 mm. patients and said, well, can we predict the people at greatest risk? And yes, there were a couple of predictors, but they were really not terribly useful in clinical practice. So when you see the patient, it's difficult to predict who's going to get a septic mm -hmm. complication. Uh, what we also know is that the risk is very low. Most people with Quincy actually present with a Quincy rather than presenting to their GP with, with a sore throat. But in the people who you do see with an acute sore throat, uh, the, the, the Quincy rate was uh, only three in a thousand. So it's, it's, it's really quite a low risk. It's difficult to predict, uh, and we know that antibiotics do have a small role. Uh, the antibiotics, immediate antibiotics, reduce the risk of septic complications by about a third, and the same appears to be the case with delayed prescribing. There seems to be a one-third reduction in risk. So even if you saw the patient and prescribed, that two out of three of the people that were going to get a Quincy will get it anyway. Mm. Uh, in, t in order to prevent those Quincy's, you'd have to prescribe for thousands of people to prevent a Quincy. Mm. So the balance uh, for the prescriber is, well, do I prescribe to three, four thousand people to try and prevent that one case of Quincy and to stop the patient coming back to see me and complaining uh, at me? Mm. Um, and, uh, or, or, and, but of, of course, one in ten people will probably get side effects. Some people might get severe allergic reactions. Mm. Um, so, and I think that it, there's a balance there, and you have to have that discussion. It will be an awkward yeah. discussion, but that's the one you have to have when the patient comes back to see you. And I think that's always a difficult thing because those particular cases, when you've had a complaint, uh, always do resonate more, you know, strongly in your mind when you're choosing to prescribe or not to prescribe in future. Yeah. Do you think that uh, when we're seeing someone and choosing not to prescribe, should we discuss the possibility of complications with them at that time? Is there time to discuss in the consultation? Or yeah. well, how should we be imparting yeah. that message? Yeah, I think that's difficult. Um, that's going to be an individual choice. It might uh, depend on the patient who, you, who you're seeing and what you mm. know about them. Mm. It might depend on how severely unwell they are, whether you talk about uh, the risk of Quincy and, and uh, septic complications. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Um, so I think that really is a personal choice mm. around that one. So there's a few more questions to cover. One of them was about are we encouraging um, nationally 
the computer suppliers to develop the fever pain score and so we mm. are doing that yes. um, and then um, can we use fever pain the score in children very quick answer to that uh, yes you can okay has it been trialed uh, I can't remember now, you have to, you're testing me on the entry criteria for the study, but I think it included children, but you'll have to go and read it. Okay, Okay. so yeah, we think it's including children. So, and then um, finally, at the start of the presentation, you showed some newspaper clips. Yep. Do you think the media has a role to play in helping to control antibiotic use? And I think the answer is yes. Uh, we know that uh, patient demand is one of the things which kind of enters the consultation and that around 40% of people are expecting antibiotics when they when they come in to see you and of course in you know today's society there's the you know the desire for the quick fix I feel terrible I mean you do feel terrible you have a, a sore throat people will come in their throat will be inflamed they say they say it's like swallowing razor blades they want to get back to work tomorrow so and you kind of as a GP you want to help them but we've looked at the data and actually you don't help them an awful lot by giving them an antibiotic. Uh, so I think helping patients understand the limited role of antibiotics for symptom relief would be good. Uh, helping patients understand the risks of antibiotic resistance is also good. So I think the media is part of the solution, if you like, in terms of raising the awareness of both antibiotic resistance and the limitations of antibiotics. Um, so I think, and I think in, in, in my practicing lifetime it's become much easier that, yeah. that now when I see people and I do my clinical assessment and I say well look I've examined your chest I don't think you have pneumonia I don't think there's much to be gained from antibiotics people will sometimes now say well thank you for that actually I didn't want to take them I just wanted that reassurance so I think it's much easier now than it was perhaps 15 years ago when maybe the expectations were much higher I and mean, we were not getting this publicity about antibiotic resistance. So of course and now we're coming up to Antibiotic Awareness Day and yep. World Antibiotics Awareness Week is starting on the 14th and so just briefly Steve before we go mm. um, what are you doing in your practice and what should we be encouraging yes. GPs to do to raise awareness around Antibiotic Awareness Day? Well I think we try to publicise it in our practice there are a lot of posters uh, that you can download from the RCGP Target Toolkit uh, so you can put them on your, uh, your waiting room systems or put them on your notice boards. Um, we are encouraging people to sign up to be antibiotic guardians, both clinicians and the public. Anyone who has uh, you know, had an experience of not using antibiotics and is, has been converted to, uh, to changing the antibiotic use, they can be very strong advocates to, to changing uh, the way that, that we expect to use antibiotics. So um, yeah, I think, I think reminding all the clinicians about all the tools that are available to reduce antibiotic prescribing. So I think it's a, a week that we have to really think about all the things that we can be doing to reduce prescribing. Well, thanks very much. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Steve. Well, that's the end of our second webinar. And many thanks for participating. I do know that, you have, that we've reinforced your own antibiotic prescribing and how important it is, as it does affect resistance in your individual patients. Don't forget to explore all the materials associated with this webinar, including looking at the fever pain scoring system. This really does help target prescribing. You can replay the video, looking at the presentation in more detail, or the whole webcast. And you'll also find links to the sore throat audit template. You'll soon be receiving an email um, from Sally asking you to reflect on how you may take forward actions suggested in this webinar and giving us some feedback. Please do complete this if possible, as it will help us all to improve. See you next week for webinar three during World Antibiotic Awareness Week, when our topic will be managing patients' expectations in acute cough with Dr. Nick Francis. Until then, from all of us, goodbye and please do encourage your friends and colleagues to take part.